Hi everyone, thank you so much for joining me for another episode of The Creative Strategist. I love getting to do these podcasts and now with the new video format, I just feel like it's this extra level of connection that in you know 2021, having come out of 2020, I as an extrovert so desperately need, so thank you all for being here. That being said, if you are listening on any sort of podcasting platform, just know that you can jump over to YouTube if you ever want to actually watch the conversation between me and my guest. Now there is video. Yay! (laughs) This episode is really inspiring. I say that probably every time, but I do mean it every time. Matthew Lindblad is my guest on the show, and he is just a creative in the truest sense of the word. He does all sorts of creative mediums, and I just walked away from this feeling really excited about the creative process, about the learning process, about continuing to stay curious as a creative and explore these different mediums. I know that you will get something out of this podcast because I certainly did. So without further ado, let's get into today's episode. You're listening to The Creative Strategist. Every episode, we learn from fellow professionals, leaders, and entrepreneurs. From purpose to product, leadership to lead generation, This podcast runs the gamut on all things business. We get full perspectives from people who put in the work every single day. Whether they are at the helm or behind the screens, pushing the pixels or developing the strategy. I can't wait to learn with all of you. Let's get started. I'm going to read your bio. It'll blush. Because it was so good. Please blush. I think everyone would want to see it. <laughs> Why are you blushing? <laughs> I'm just going to add things in there. Okay. Matthew is a multimedia creative Swiss army knife based in Orange County, California. He has a BA in entertainment media from Middlesex University in London, England, as well as a recording engineer certificate from Citrus College in Glendora and Pro Tool certification from Studio West in San Diego. He is currently wrapping up a master's degree in marketing communication management at University of Denver. Alongside his education, Matthew works for the Walt Disney Company and for Knott's Berry Farm as a cinematographer where he's been for nearly a decade. If that's not enough for you, everybody, (laughs) Matthew has toured nationally as a professional musician in signed bands, including summer runs on the Vans Warped Tour, His freelancing career includes music production, graphic design, filmmaking, sound design, songwriting, acting, and marketing, with some of his most notable clients being Warner Brothers, Coca-Cola, Elf Cosmetics, and that um, EP or that playlist is dope, by the way, you should listen to it, Alicia Keys, The Jim Henson Company, Yogurtland, The Walking Dead, and more. In his free time, Matthew plays in his one-man band, Rebel Revive, rated in the top five live bands in OC 2014, in which he writes all the music, performs all the instruments, and sings on the recordings. Dang. As he takes a sip from his (laughs) water cup. Welcome, Matthew. Thank you. you. I'm so glad to be here. That's literally taken away from my website. I was... (laughs) You know what? It was so good. I was like, I'm just going to read it and I'm yes. going to read it with gusto. I'm stuck. You nailed it. That was, that was Thank beautiful. Um, yeah. It's, it's funny. Like even just hearing that back, I'm like, that's right. Yeah. 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 Like, cause some of it, my projects are just so all over the place. So I'm like, mm-hmm. Jim Henson, that stuff. Yep. That's right. That happened. Yeah. I, I but did I love that. It. It's a cool <laughs> amalgamation that I've collected over the whatever 15 20 years of my my uh creating so it's so cool that you do so many different things i i think it's amazing and i think a lot of people maybe put pressure on like finding the one thing we'll probably talk about that later yes but i think it's so special when creatives can create in different fields because every time you're creating it just adds something more to the art that maybe you're you're kind of 
more inclined to in the moment. Absolutely. Right. I, I think it, it's funny too. Cause like on that note and, and like you said, we'll talk more about it later, but I think it just became like, I didn't like waiting around for others. So I was like, yeah. I'm doing this myself. Like, Oh, I need an album like artwork designed. Okay. Well I can just jump yeah. on YouTube and learn or well, at that time YouTube wasn't as popular, but, um, but yeah, it's just like teach myself and, and make it happen. Um, I think there may be something in there that like a therapist would tell me maybe I am a control freak as well, but um, I cannot confirm or deny. <laughs> you know what? <laughs> Whatever works for you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So um, yeah. Yeah. I think that's great. I just saw this um, Gary Vee post today where he was saying, have an idea, make it, have an idea, make it. And he's like, forget the middle. Yep. So that, look, there you are. In my life so far. <laughs> but it's interesting because I think there is a pressure still, and I, I don't know if it's like self-inflicted, but I think there is a pressure to find that one thing. Mm -hmm. uh, I was having a conversation with a colleague recently about it and she was like, well, why not do everything? And I'm like, yeah, that's true. I guess that is like a way of life. Um, and it's been all I've known. So I think up until this point, I've done everything. And now like in my adulthood, I'm like, wait a second maybe I pick one thing and just master it. But um, I think that's just like a self-inflicted and also just kind of like a societal pressure that I've felt, especially recently. Cause it's like with COVID going on, I'm like, man, if I just had, if I was just a sound designer, like I would just be looking for sound design work and doing that like full time. But instead I'm like, wait, like which way do I want to go? And like trying to grab all these different ends and so it, it definitely complicates things a little bit, but I think the way my brain works, it's so ADD that like, that's so incredibly stimulating where if I was just a recording engineer, I'd be like, eh, you know, and like, I feel like would have some regrets in it. So um, it's just been a matter of really knowing myself and, and understanding kind of what t makes me tick and what I'm passionate about. And that is everything. <laughs> it's like just yeah. getting to do like, any project that comes my way. And sometimes I suck at it. Like, I'm gonna be real honest, like recently someone came to me and said, hey, can you do a lyric video? And I just was like, that, like, I've tried that before and it was gosh awful. I'm like, I cannot sit there and like animate text in and out of like a window and make it look cool. It's just something I haven't practiced, but um, I still know my limits, but it's like, it is fun. <laughs> Have stuff thrown at me and be like, that's what we're doing today, <laughs> you know, so. Yeah, right. I mean, I find that I get bored very quickly and it sounds like, I mean, there's one way to remedy that, do something different every day. Exactly, exactly. And that, I think that just happens, that's happened in my life naturally um, where, you know, I'm jumping from job to job or freelance project to whatever. And I do like, I do have consistency, like, um, I've been working for the Disney company for six years now. Um, and it's kind of like my weekend getaway is what I, I call it. Um, <laughs> I've been there six years and I'm still like one of the lower in seniority. So um, there's like four, like 30 or 40 bellmen and like guys above me. Um, and they just have been there for like 30 years and they never That's leave. Crazy. They have their schedules. And so anytime they want to take a little day off, it's like, hey, Lindblad. You know, you want a day on Tuesday? And so I, I kind of like create my own schedule with it. So it's perfect because I'm guaranteed or just about guaranteed, like maybe two days a weekend. And then the rest I can just fill in throughout projects. So it's like that kind of keeps me at least a little grounded. And then I'm able to freelance the rest of the week um, to kind of fill in the gap. So it's a beautiful thing. <laughs> That's great. Yeah. That's so great. I was just going to ask you first, where do you think that curiosity comes from or what do you think drives it to want to do so many different things? Do you think it's boredom? Do you think it's something deeper? No, um, no I, I mean, like full transparency, like I, I was diagnosed with ADD, ADHD, like from an early age. And um, I think that a lot of it comes from that. I think like growing up in school and being like, hey, for the next X amount of hours, we're learning about this thing. And then you're gonna go home and do homework on that subject that just drove me nuts because it was like okay but 
like this hour I feel like creating music and like this hour I feel like you know doodling or you know whatever um and so I think it just like from a really early age I just I fell in love with the creative process more than one entity in creation um and I think that's what led to just like picking up all these random skills now I mean like they've always been based in music and kind of like film or like entertainment um I never was great at like drawing or like hey like let's paint like that would have been my nightmare <laughs> <laughs> um which like maybe I I don't know I haven't tried it really but um so like fine arts and things like that I have a, a massive respect for but I'm not um I don't excel in um but so it's partially that it's partially growing up with ADD but also I grew up in a musical household. Um, so my dad played music um, basically up until I was born. He was like touring in bands and um, was like a worship leader and uh, was playing camps and all sorts of stuff, putting out records. And so I actually grew up like not only hearing him play music, but then also he would like strategically place like paint cans around me. And I would just like bang on paint cans with wooden spoons like I was a drummer and like lo and behold when I became you know enough to like or like old enough to know what I was doing I was like wait a second there's like muscle memory here and jumped on on drums and like fell in love with playing drums and so um, it was partially like an upbringing and then partially just the personality that I feel like God gifted me with of just like loving um loving art, loving, yeah, the creative process. And um, it, it's funny, like, I think a lot of creatives, once they finalize their project, they're like, yes, like, I'm bummed once a project's out, because I'm like, ah, like, my favorite stuff is like, now gone, like, because I just love crafting it. Yeah. And I think like, that's, that's really what I, I find a lot of joy in. Like if I'm working on a record and just like writing those songs and getting the best performances, like that's what I fall in love with. And then once it's out, I'm like, it's cool. Yeah. <laughs> I, I guess, you know, it, I guess now it's time for other people to enjoy it, but maybe that's why I like sit on the songs I write for so long, but. Um, so interesting. Yeah. Like the process is the most fun part for you. It is. Yeah, it is. Cause I think it's the most stimulating. Like once, once it's out of my hands, then my job's done, you know, like yeah. there obviously is a marketing aspect to it and follow up and, and all that sort of thing, like promoting the music or the film or whatever it may be. Um, but I really like the ideating, like kind of brainstorming process, working with other artists to develop their songs. Um, and then, I mean, truthfully, like, performing is another one that I I really love um so once I get to perform the songs I think that's it almost like is that creative process again yeah but like because there's so many things that can go wrong or right and I think that like it's that feel again subconsciously because yeah. it's like oh we can actually hmm. go direction with this like I could jump off stage into the crowd and run around with my guitar and then jump back back on stage and throw my body around on stage like if you've seen uh like you know if you've seen our band live or like it, people know rebel revive is like a high energy rock show um when we do full band stuff and so um i think there is that aspect of like kind of anything goes it's on like kind of gritty and emotional um and so i think that kind of taps back into that creative process as well it's like oh the song our bodies are supposed to be doing the songs but then um is just kind of like a I don't know like a I don't want to say like freestyle way about it but it's like there's still a lot of creativity that happens on the stage um yeah kind of like cool. the risk is back yeah almost the risk is back. and and I mean like then I really get to like experience that emotion that went into the writing with 200 other people in the crowd um yeah I think that's really exciting too. Um, and just kind of like getting to spill myself because the songs that I write are incredibly me. Like I don't, um, Rebel Revive is like an incredibly personal project. And so 
uh, it's never been like, I'm going to write a hit song for the masses that doesn't mean anything to me. Like, it's never been like that. It's just like, oh, this song's about a time where I felt like worthless and felt like I wasn't deserving of like having a beautiful woman in my life because I was such a mess in my own personal life. You know, just like, whoa, that's heavy. And it's so personal. Um, but the cool thing about that is then I think it inspires others to make it their own meaning. Um, so when I put out the music, I don't say like literally, this is what this song means. It's like, I just put out the music and let it live um, yeah. and people assign their own meanings to it. So um, yeah, it kind of replays on that creative process all over again. So. Yeah, and I think people relate to that kind of authenticity and vulnerability always. Yeah. Because we're all like, it's just the human condition. Like we all go through these things together one way or another. So absolutely. Yeah. That makes perfect sense to me. I will say that there's still room for like just the kind of no brainer <laughs> jams. Like, of course, you know, fun stuff. But to me, the songs that really get me are like, you know, Come All You Weary by Thrice, where it's just like, yeah. Oh, this like pulls on my heartstrings and um, it, the, the way I kind of like gauge music if it is powerful and impactful is like if I listen to a song even if I don't know the artist and it gives me goosebumps like if it causes a physical reaction in me I know it's good and so yeah. um, I try to do the same with like what I write um, and I think that's why it takes me a little longer of a time to like actually write songs because like there's just so many different tweaks and nuances and, and um, adjustments to like even just single lyrics or, you know, vocal melody or a drum part or whatever um, that I make that it like takes longer. But I, I think it's because I'm trying to create songs that like I would listen to and have that feeling for rather than just be like, oh, I'm just here to tell a story. Like it's like, I want to actually blast this on my stereo too and just be like "Ooh, yeah <laughs> you know, like, yeah of course kind of it's kind of like a funny um i don't know standards to hold it to but that's just what that's I've a learned. great standard yeah that's just what i've learned so i have like an an off topic question but i know how i write music and it's all at one time like it all comes together sound and lyrics and everything all at the same time how do you write songs is it like a riff at first or does it change? That's a great question. Um, so I, I like playing all the instruments, I've also accumulated a skill where I can hear the song not done fully in its entirety, but like I can hear the song's progression if I just have a single riff on guitar. So um, nice. it's almost like the best way to describe it is it's almost like beatboxing all the instruments at once in your head while yeah. playing guitar to it. Um, like so Michael Jackson. I, <laughs> I guess, man, like that's a cool. Uh, that's what I've heard. Yeah, I don't, I, wow, yeah. I, I guess like Michael Jackson, yeah. Um, I so, hope that's not wrong, but that is what I've heard. <laughs> no, I mean like that's, that's amazing, yeah. Um, and definitely Prince, Prince was like, well known for that too is just playing everything um but yeah it usually starts on a guitar riff so um i'll open up pro tools which is like a recording music recording software and i'll just lay down some like kind of guitar riff ideas usually they're more rhythm guitar um because i'm i'm a rhythm player um not the greatest at lead guitar like i can't like shred solos or anything so I'll lay down some rhythm and then start building drums and bass and those sorts of things around it. And I usually write the entire song fully musical and then start putting vocals on it. Um, I will say I'm like incredibly critical on my vocals. Uh, not, not my like vocal ability, but just like the melodies and the lyrics have to just like be banging on every song. <laughs> nice. um, because the way that I write in that process is I picture what the crowd's going to be reacting to as I'm writing it. So um, like one of the, the better examples, I have a song called the voices. And so um, there's a lot of like kind of group, like, whoa type sing-along parts and like kind of chanty parts. Oh, where cool. 
sings it back to me and those sorts of things. And so I try to think of like, what's going to engage a live audience. And then also like, what's going to engage someone that's just sitting at home, like jamming out to it. And so I'm always trying to like write from the listener's perspective as well, rather than just like, I'm going to put out songs and I hope someone understands me. I'm like, I'm, I want to put out music that people are going to like just vibe to and like really get energized by. And a lot of the content or the, a lot of like the, um, the theming is very um, redemptive and positive and like encouraging and those sorts of things. And so I always try to make sure that whatever I'm writing, there's like a purpose to it rather than just like, I'm going to talk about like money and cool cars or, you know, whatever. I'm like, <laughs> I want to like inspire, like to me, to my core, I want to inspire other kids to pick up an instrument and be another me or better or be, you know, the next Prince or the next Michael Jackson or whatever. Um, because I think that's the beauty of art is we get to pass it down through the generations. Um, one of the most inspiring times in my life was, it's probably about 10 or 11 and was just getting into music. And like, my dad was buying me some like Christian records cause I grew up in a Christian household. And there was a band called the Newsboys, which were like, massively popular in the christian market yeah. um, and they had all these cool pop jams from they're like from australia i believe and i remember seeing them in an airport so my family was on this trip and i saw the newsboys in the airport and i was like oh like i was so starstruck i'm like oh my gosh those are those people i've seen in music videos and like <laughs> magazines and all this stuff and my dad's like well why don't you go meet them you know because he grew up in like in the Christian or the, the music scene and he was just like they're just dudes but to me they were like legends so I walked over there and uh was like hey uh can you sign this and it was probably like I don't know potato chip bag whatever I had <laughs> I don't know <laughs> uh, and uh and he's like yeah it was Peter Fuller the former singer and he's like yeah and he goes do you play music and I go yeah and he's like all right but I'm going to sign this, but you have to make me a promise that you will make music for our kids. And I was like, oh my goodness. Like mm -hmm. that, it just like, it sat with me that there's almost a responsibility to continue this handoff of like just beautiful art and art that inspires and art that empowers. Um, and so ever since then, I'm like, I just, I want to inspire with this stuff. Like, sure. It's fun. Like, it's fun being out there. It's fun having 200 eyes on you. Like it's, it's a, you know, natural high that you get. Um, and there is that aspect to it of just like performing. But um, I think the deeper meaning is just kind of like inspiring others to create. Because if you can do that, then the world just is such a beautiful place. So. Yeah. yeah. And it sounds like, of course, there's the purpose of like, perpetuating your faith too which is like a whole other layer of of like responsibility so yeah I, I mean I have I would say I have like slightly controversial opinions on that stuff um I, like I, I would say that growing up in a Christian music scene there is quite a bit of alienation from um like maybe maybe where like a general listener wouldn't really be able to connect with the music because they're not a Christian, if that makes sense. So that was always my fear of like um, ever just being like, Hey, we're a Christian band. And I never, I never have, I, I, I really don't like that. It's in the same way that if I was going to hire a plumber, I wouldn't hire a Christian plumber. You know, it's like, <laughs> I'm not going to go out. I need a Christian plumber. Like I can only hire someone who's a Christian plumber. It's like, what, why not just put out good inspirational music and let that impact others? It doesn't always have to have the label of something. Um, like you want it to be accessible, basically. I want it to be accessible, but, but also like, I want people to just hear real life stories through the music. And I think as soon as you go, like, you know, as soon as someone sees Christian rock band on Spotify, like as the genre, I think anyone that's not of that world would be like, Ugh. Hmm. like, I think you run the risk of doing that. Um, and so me, like, I am a believer. I, you know, I 
um, grew up in a Christian household and as an adult have made my faith my own as well. Um, but I think that it's important to just put out good art. I think like that's, that's what it is and that's what it lives at. I don't think it's as important to like label it Christian or any, any other like religion or subculture or anything like that. Um, I think it's just good expression, your expression. Yeah. Yeah, Just like put out the expression and yeah, that's a good way to put it. Um, Because I know, especially from like playing shows and touring and that sort of thing, I know what that also does to the musicians in the band. There's like this immense amount of pressure to have this like squeaky clean lifestyle and like, because you're, you're then this like Christian hero and we see it so often of, um, any sort of like misstep, any sort of controversy, any sort of like, you know, the wrong tweet, the wrong, you know, whatever it may be, then the masses go, well, aren't you a Christian? You don't get to do that. And it's like, Ooh, yeah, I'm also human. So I also make mistakes. I also hurt, uh, you know? And so I think, I think that's also another kind of danger of being like, we're a Christian band or like, I'm a Christian artist. <laughs> yeah. um, it's, it's not so much like a higher call to responsibility. Um, there is that, but like, I think there's also this, like this pressure to pretend like you're perfect. And I'm like, that's not what Jesus calls us to. <laughs> uh, no, we're definitely not perfect. Like we're Nobody's perfect. So, um, so yeah, I, I think, I don't, I don't know if that's controversial. Maybe it is. I, I think I've that, heard that from others before. Yeah. Like whether and granted, like, I mean, you do rock, right? The others that stick out in my mind that I've heard this from, their genre doesn't necessarily fit on like a Christian radio station, right? Because it's like oh. a very specific sound. Yeah, yeah. Um, and for them, they just were like, "That's not like it is a a deep part of us," and then we're expressing who we are, so it comes out in um who we are and like what music we make, but that's not um the the label that we would say we fall under um as a band yeah so I mean I totally see where you're coming from definitely absolutely um okay my next question was how do you think studying so many different crafts has made you stronger as a creative or anything that you've noticed like I'm so glad I do everything because (laughs) I transferred that one piece of my art to another and I'll say when I wrote this question I was thinking about when I used to dance and everyone would say even if you want to be a hip-hop dancer start with ballet and you would just like transfer it was like a foundational piece almost okay that's interesting I I didn't know that because we have that in the music industry as well it's kind of like it's not like a unspoken rule but it's like hey learn piano before you learn anything because like Hmm. you know so many things are structured around just classic train like classical training and and those sorts of things so yeah um but I think in terms of like overall the place that it's helped me the most is understanding the viewpoint of like what's the best way to put this so like for example if I'm working in on a marketing project um say like the elf cosmetics um holiday album that I did for example so I didn't come in as like a record producer for that. It was like, hey, um, we want you to help market this album. Like, can you put it together? Can you grab artists? This and that. And so I was hired for marketing and I was hired for developing the marketing strategy for that um, and to push that along. But because I knew the music language, I also was able to go out and talk to the record producer who was like, you know, really getting in there and editing vocals and like developing the song and this and that. So just knowing that language really helped like push the project forward because there weren't as many people like in our company that really knew that language. And so they'd be like, make it sound better, you know? And it's like, right. okay, well, like, what does, you know, what does that mean? And I'd be like, Hey man, that's a sick hook on the second verse, but I'm thinking like if you could EQ maybe a little bit off like maybe 600 hertz, you know, or like whatever, maybe just talking more specifics and getting into the nitty gritty with them. I think that helps out. And I think that goes across all my creative um, 
kind of professions like yeah. I mean even just um because then it became from that like once the songs were done then we we're doing video packages for the songs for like TikTok and all that stuff so then knowing the language of like I'm not as well versed in TikTok but at least knowing the language of like video development and filmmaking I you know I could throw suggestions in there and and so I think just it broadens my vocabulary for all the different creative industries so I can be a better part of the conversation and kind of like assist the different departments. Um, and so, yeah, I think that, that was a great answer. Thanks. Yeah. I've, I've experienced that too. Cause I, I started in fashion design, but then I got really interested in at least learning like basics of coding. Right. Um, okay. But then when you talk to people who let's say are building your website or when you talk to people who are trying to recreate a vision for a pair of jeans, like I worked in the denim industry, how do you look at something and say, oh, it's just not quite right, but be able to like specifically say why? Yeah. And I think um, the same way like math is ideas on paper sort of you're translating like if you can be the translator good, for your yeah. own projects huge that's a great way to put it it's it's the translator and I think especially being a producer where you're handling a lot of different people yeah. like it's incredibly important to be able to translate so yeah that makes sense I didn't know you did coding that's cool I mean barely but to be able to at least know enough that when someone tells you like, I can't do it. Yeah. And you're like, I know you can. <laughs> Cause if I can do it, you can do it sort of thing. Or like, Hey, could you fix that padding on that thing? But no one knows what that's called. Right. So you can say, Oh, I just, I don't know why, but it looks small and it's over there. But if you, like you were saying EQ and all these lingo things. Yeah. If you can translate that, you save a ton of time. Yeah. And then you also, um, avoid the risk of being limited when you of having fake limitations put on you because you don't you just don't know that's true yeah I think having the knowledge yeah, yeah I mean it, it opens up the possibilities really yeah. um the I think the time I've experienced it or the times rather that I've experienced it the most are in record producing so um in developing any like anyone's songs that are not my own or actually even in my own um, knowing how to get the artist and like myself as a producer on the same page towards the same goal, you have to know like what they're talking about. So like, for example, the artist would be like, Hey, yeah, I just kind of want it to sound like a little more like warm. Mm -hmm. I mean, like, anyone else would be like, what in the heck are you talking about? <laughs> like, what do you mean warm? Like, you know? <laughs> you're like, bright. Uh, like, <laughs> Okay. Yeah. And so like, if you, if you don't know kind of like how to get other language out of them and how to translate that onto like an audio software or through instruments or things like that, like it's going to be a mess. And so yeah, the game is like, I tell people when I'm talking about like producing music, um, I'm like, I'm literally delivering people's brainchild, like, because yes. they, they come to me and they're like, I've got this thing in here and I need you to take it like to your hands on an instrument and then also like into a computer and then into other people's ears. It's like, that's nuts. Like the concept is. is crazy to me. I'm like, <laughs> the fact that like ideas can just live up here and then all of a sudden they're now to thousands, hundreds of thousands of people sometimes like, and so, yeah. but it takes that translator. It takes that person that can um, like, almost like get into the head of the artist and be like, is this what you mean? And like try different things. Um, it's a real, real difficult skill. And it, it definitely causes some hard conversations because there's so much like, uh, it, like it's partially ego, but it's also partially, um, there's just this like raw sensitivity when someone, uh, well, so like right now I'm studying communication management. So it'd be like creating like a psychologically safe environment to share those ideas, but also to turn down those ideas. And so like that relationship is so incredibly important because 
if they just see you as, as the producer, as someone who's like, that sucks, that's lame, don't do that. Like they're not gonna bring their best ideas to the, the table. And then in the same way, like me delivering ideas back to them being like, hey, why don't you try this line instead? I think that lyric's kind of corny. You know, I think we could do better. And so you have to create that psychologically safe environment to explore those ideas. Cause like everyone's, you know, um, everyone's creativity is like out there and it's just like this very palpable thing. So yeah, it's really unique. That's so fascinating. I think um, I'll, I'll say like one more thing on this and then I'll move on to the next <laughs> question. But I think I imagine that Simon Sinek, I just think of that graph where it's like that part of your emotions that you can't put into words. Yeah. And I think as designers, and my boss used to say this when I did fashion design, she would say, it's, it's very similar every season, but our job is to know like that feeling, that thing that's coming that we're seeing consistently through inspiration or through the idea of the creative director or whatever it is, knowing what that is and being able to say it and then translate it through tech packs and whatever to, like you said, hundreds usually of yeah. different people who are then going to make it and make <laughs> so many copies of it and, co and copies. It's just fascinating. Um, it, it goes through so many, so cool, so many hands in a yeah. department like that, or like in a uh, in a company like that too. I think that's always fascinating. Is it's like because then everyone kind of gets a personal touch on what it becomes. Yeah. And uh, yeah, and then, but also then to reel back to go like understanding the customer and their needs, like that becomes a whole thing too. It's like, it, it's kind of similar to like record producing. Yeah. Be like, like, what are your needs? Like, what is the song that you are trying to get? How do we get there? So it's this, it's definitely this kind of like life cycle. It's pretty, pretty interesting yeah. stuff. Honestly, we could do like a whole episode on, <laughs> on like, people's ideas, taking them in, knowing your ideas as a creative, and then setting that aside and saying like, I'm not the client. <laughs> going oh. That's a whole episode. It's so true. great. My next question for you is back to what we were talking about in the beginning. Out of all these art forms, is there any one that you're partial to? Or do you think the end goal is to really get to a place where you're just overseeing all of them so you get to touch all these different things all the time i think uh so yes to answer the question one of them is more prominent it would it would be music um mm -hmm. i love filmmaking i but i'm pretty new to it like i just started teaching myself probably like four years ago um how to operate cameras and tell a story through um through visuals uh the way i'm doing now but music has always been my first love like I grew up listening to rock bands and punk and hardcore and ska and uh, just being at shows any chance I could get and so I think that'll always be the probably like the forefront of my interests um and my my love for creativity I just don't know if it's like the most practical to pay the bills for like a future mm -hmm. family and kids <laughs> <laughs> and that's just like that's just like real life um that I've you know kind of been paging over over the past few years I mean um you know I always wanted to grow up and tour and be on the road and just like travel and make memories with my friends I mean that was the dream um after doing that a little bit I'm like I don't think this is it like I think I had checked off that box and was like this is not what I thought it would be and let's also like try to do something else in that same realm and so that's what led me to start going back to school and actually like pursue an education um is kind of leaving that behind of being like ah touring's rad but like I get homesick and also like sleeping next to seven other smelly people that haven't showered in a couple days like <laughs> eh, you know and so um I think that's that's the beauty of a life and I think that's the way my career is the trajectory of my career is kind of gone is just like bouncing off these different things on the way to maybe being like a creative director over all of them um so yeah to to your point i think that is maybe the landing spot of like getting to touch all these different industries and different um like creative processes like but all for one ugh, 
punch my mic all for one goal <laughs> um and because uh, to me that's really exciting like i love working with people i am such a people person um i'm energized by conversation and deep intellectual like <laughs> just like entertaining like weird concepts yeah. and sorts of things and so um i feel like just being like a like if I was just doing music production, I, it's there's it's so isolating um, for like 90% of the time. And then there's like 10% of the time where you get to create with others. But a lot of it's just mixing by yourself and like, you know, and sitting in a studio all yeah. dark, like in front of your computer. Um, and so I think kind of being more of a creative director w would be, I think, the dream at this point. Um, now that may change. I mean, it's like my interests are always changing. Um, but I think there's some core values of just like working with people, being creative, um, you know, also like leading teams. I, I really enjoy that too. So, um, yeah, I think, yeah, I'm, I'm fine with that answer. <laughs> yeah. I love it. No, well, that's great. And it sounds like with everything else, you know, it's the journey that gets you the most excited. So that makes sense. To... Yeah. It's great. Um, all right. What inspires you most? What gets your creative juices going? Hmm. That's a good one. Um, I think seeing other, other creatives come alive, like with their projects. So like seeing other people get excited to, be putting out like pieces of art or a new shoot or that sort of thing. I think that always inspires me. Cause I'm like, Oh, that's right. I know that feeling like, let me go for my, you know, my thing. Yeah. Um, definitely one of the more ins inspirational things is just the people that I'm surrounded by um, that I've kind of handpicked to like kind of keep tabs on and keep an eye on um, with their projects. Um, I think other things that inspire me would be uh, like my parents. <laughs> like I, I've never thought of that really as like a, like an answer, but I, I think genuinely like my dad is one of the hardest working people I know um, and has just been so like, he just keeps his head down and just grinds like the work day and is just so full of joy and like, um, just like so great with people and I, that inspires me i'm like if i can impact that many people without just being like this braggadocious like you know here i am like you know he's just so humble and just like such a hard worker um so that's consistently inspiring and just such a, a man of god as well um and his love with my mom is just like this beautiful thing i'm like if i could have something that's even like half of that like i'll be i'll be happy so um so they're consistently inspiring me just you know from from an early age um what else i think just like i love consuming just like all these different sources of media so like if it's watching films if it's reading a book if it's um i just try to like kind of keep it interesting um and honestly just people people in general like these kinds of conversations inspire me um you know a lot of times lately it's been sitting at a beach with like one other person just like talking about life and i leave those conversations just like yeah like just so fired up <laughs> just like life is awesome this is a beautiful thing i'm so grateful that i just get to wake up and have another day like you know and just experience deep conversations and conversations about life and so um yeah. i think i think it's those really um yeah that's great yeah yeah it's definitely a perspective right it is it is so is um speaking of perspective <laughs> What are some obstacles that you've had to overcome and what do you think that you've learned from them? That's a, that's a good one. 
I think I say that about all these questions. They're all great questions. Um, <laughs> I'm so glad. Yeah. Or one obstacle, I guess. You don't have to rattle off a bunch, but some something that you've taken away from a setback. Yeah. Um, so one of the hardest things I had to face, like in my kind of music career was like, I was turning into something that I never want to be. So um, with touring, with playing in like more popular bands for a while, I just realized that like, I really wasn't ready and like set up for, I didn't set myself up for success. Um, and so, you know, I like, I was achieving dreams that I'd had as a kid, but like in the deepest, darkest depression I've ever been in. Um, and I think it was just because like, I was, I was out there with people that became dear friends and like, and that sort of thing. But I felt so isolated because I like was and am a person of faith and no one else in my band was. And it was like being able to have hard conversations about like, Hey, I'm really depressed. Like, can we just, can you pray for me? <laughs> like yeah. those didn't happen. Like it wasn't a place for that. And like, I was respectful of that. Like, you know, I, I didn't want to be like, Hey, you know, always trying to talk to people about what I believed or, or didn't believe. Um, but, uh, I think once I started like living that dream, like air quotes, um, I realized that like, it wasn't like a healthy environment for me. And so, um, I just, I got home from being on tour, super depressed, like struggling with, um, you know, struggling with like addiction a little bit of, of more, like not really substances, but more of just like the attention. Like I, you know, mm. I just loved like, yes, all these people are, you know, a part of this. I'm like, oh, I'm getting, you know, I'm signing autographs. And like, it just became this kind of like ego type thing. And I'm like, it's not good. Like, it's not, it wasn't healthy for me. Um, some people can do it, but like, I just, at that moment in my life, I was, um, I was not ready. Like I was not in a healthy like headspace. And so I got home from tour and went to church and, um, was with some of my small group guys. So like, it was like maybe six of us, um, that would kind of gather weekly and, you know, do like little Bible study and stuff and man stuff. Um, and so we were all, uh, doing like prayer requests, you know, like, Hey, like, how can we pray for you this week and whatever. And, um, mine was like, Hey, I don't, I don't know what I'm supposed to do. Like, I feel like this is what I've been dreaming of dreaming of my whole life, but like, it doesn't seem right. Like, it doesn't seem like it's in this capacity. Um, and at that point, the band I was playing with was going on a tour with a band who was just like, absolutely disgusting content um just in terms of like lyrics and lifestyle and just all this stuff that I was like embarrassed to even put my name on as someone who um kind of took pride in like living a different sort of lifestyle <laughs> um you know a little more hope driven and those sorts of things and so um we were praying and yeah I kind of laid out the scenario for them and we said, we were like, amen. And the pastor looks up and he's like, you know what you're supposed to do. And I was just like, oh, like I do know what I'm supposed to do. And I've known this whole time. I'm just too much of a coward to actually make the choice. And that was like a heavy takeaway. I'm like, I the, the times that we grow as humans the most are like usually stemming from a ridiculously tough decision sometimes <laughs> like yeah. not all the time like sometimes it's like minor tweaks to life but like the times where I've learned the most or grown the most have been in those moments and I knew it was one of those and so um right after small group I had band practice and the next week we were supposed to go on a national tour and like something like 30 40 different cities <laughs> like um you know, sold out crowds, all this stuff that I'd like dreamt of. And I got to band practice and was like pretty somber. I, I, I'm not one to like shy away from emotion. Like I was weeping pretty hard. 
like on the way there not like crying but like a deep like this freaking sucks because I felt I felt at that point like my life had been building up to this moment of like just touring and being cool <laughs> not cool but like <laughs> um you know and so I got there and walked in and was just like hey guys before we play a single note like I gotta talk to you and I just said I am not gonna be touring with you guys next week and this is actually my last practice with you <laughs> um and the singer started uh-huh. laughing and she was like, oh, ha, ha. like, you're, you know, whatever. And I'm like, I'm dead serious. Like, this is it. Um, and the other guys just pulled me outside and they're like, dude, this sucks. And we're so, so bummed we're going to lose you. But we also completely understand. And we also like see how miserable you've been. Like, mentally you know just through our conversations and through just like kind of you know observing um and we get it and like we and honestly like we're proud of you and that was such a wow just powerful moment because you know I think we build it up in our heads we're like they're gonna hate us and never talk to us again and like all these things which are just like the lie of the enemy and I had those like driving there I was like oh maybe like maybe I shouldn't leave. Maybe I should just stick it out. And like, I just kept lying to myself. Like I'm going to be the light that just like, you know, is the light in this dark. Like, no, I actually have to be freaking healthy for myself too. Um, And so that, that moment was definitely one of the more difficult ones because I was loving like getting to play shows all the time, but it wasn't where I was supposed to be. And it wasn't under the circumstances that I was supposed to be playing. And so that's why I started Rebel Revive is to like play the music I wanted to play, bring the message that I wanted to bring and like be surrounded by like the, the kind of musicians that I wanted to, you know, have a part of a project that puts out light, you know, in, in the darkness. And so, um, yeah, I'd say that was like probably one of the bigger ones, especially in my career. Thank you so much for sharing that. Yeah. I mean, I'm sure someone else will get a lot out of what you just shared, but that like hits a big chord with me too. And just hearing your story. um, I think we all as little kids had this like future us on a pedestal and you think like, this is the way. Yeah. But as you get older, you realize there's, I mean, there's your way and then there's the way that is meant for you all along. And sometimes yeah. it's different than what you expected. I, I definitely agree. I would say that like, I think my perspective on that, like that mentality has changed too. So I don't think life is linear. Like, I don't think like our purpose is linear where um it's like there is this thing and we're supposed to get to it like I think there's like a lot of different things that we can do and that like that we are passionate about and that like I feel you know I personally believe that like God provides for us to choose from um and so I think after all that after experiencing all that I was like that's right like I I'm empowered to choose what I want to be doing in these situations. Like, could, could some good have come from that? Like me just powering through and be like, I'm still going to play in this band. Absolutely. Um, but I think, (laughs) I think I was like empowered with the courage to not just be like, well, I want to keep doing this. Cause it, it was like self gratifying. Like it wasn't like, it wasn't bringing glory to anyone but myself and this band. (laughs) Like, um and that's cool like that that's some people's lifestyle but for me I'm like this isn't to me it's not inspiring the way that I want to inspire people um and the way and it's not showing love that is compassionate and graceful and those sorts of things um and so you know, it was kind of one of those things where I like just started weighing it out, but also knew deep inside. I was like, I know the choice that has to happen and 
I'm just kind of like tiptoeing around it. Um, and so, but I don't think it's like a linear thing. So I think that while me growing up wanting to like be a rock star basically <laughs> um, is important, I think that there's other ways to do that too. Yeah, like I think you can, you can be a rock star in many industries. Like, you know, I have friends that teach kids how to play music. Like that to me, like my friend that does that is a freaking rock star. Like that's, yeah. they're not like, look at me, like I'm doing the, you know, they're like, I'm just teaching like the masses how to enjoy this cool art form. <laughs> like, so, um, so yeah, it's, it's an interesting, interesting thing. Um, but I think we do put a pressure on ourselves to be like, well, I thought I was going to be a firefighter when I was a kid. Now I'm not a firefighter. So what the heck, you know, I just don't, I don't know. I think there's, there's some value to it, but maybe we assign too much. So I don't know. Yeah, <laughs> yeah absolutely. Um, while we're reminiscing and talking about being rock stars in different ways, out of the projects that you've done so far, what is one that you are the most proud of? Most proud of, um, I think the one that I'd be most proud of is uh, I put out a record called 11 and that was my first um, music since quitting that band, since that story I just told. So um, it ba basically was my kind of liaison back into the music industry and like the, you know, like creating in that capacity. Um, and that was the first record for from Rebel Revive that I think was like, oh, he's still alive. And <laughs> <laughs> although he quit, he's not dead um, and can actually still make music. And I think uh, it was a sense of pride for me because it was like kind of like pulling myself up from the bootstraps and dusting myself off and being like, I'm good. We're doing this my way. Um, yeah. And I felt incredibly accomplished through doing that because it was like it was a grind. Um, I recorded that album up in Sacramento. So, you know, I live in like Orange County, LA. So I would drive seven hours north every time I wanted to record a song for this record. And I think I made like probably three or four trips just back and forth because I didn't write the whole record all at once and then go record it all at once. I was like, right. uh, let's do a song. Oh, wait, I got another one. <laughs> so, um, so it was just definitely some fond memories and just like wild times putting that thing together. Um, but also it was the first time where I came out with a product where I was just like blown away that that was me. Um, because I, I think as artists, we, we can feel like, I know everyone says I'm like pretty decent, but I don't feel it, you know? And like, we'll put out a piece of content or like an artwork, you know, and artwork. That's not, <laughs> we'll put out a <laughs> Um, I was like, yes, yes, still so right there with you. <laughs> I guess content that's yeah, we'll put out, um, yeah. you know, a piece. And we just like beat ourselves up. We're like, it wasn't good enough, though. And this and that this was the first one where I was like, that is freaking good. <laughs> like, and like, that, I'm proud of myself. Yeah. Yes. Like, I just put it aside. Like, I just put that, that like, the fear and like the anxiousness and all those things aside because going into it I was like oh I don't know if people are gonna like this like it's not it's not what I was doing in the band before you know it's much more like polished and like less like hardcore and like all that and less dark um and I put it out and was just like this is it like I this is what I was supposed to be doing um and so I would say that's something I'm the most proud of. And then one of the songs got on K-Rock, which is like, you know, if you're not in California, it's like one of the main um, California rock stations at the time. Now it's more like alternative pop stuff. Um, but the single was played on K-Rock and I like told, a, like I texted a bunch of friends like, hey, tune in at this time, the song's gonna play. And I got videos back from them in their car listening to the song, like dancing and singing along. And I was just like, that's insane. <laughs> I was like, this is the coolest thing. Uh, <laughs> because not only is it me on vocal, but it's like everything is me. So 
I'm like five times more passionate about it because I did everything on it. Um, yeah. And so, yeah, I think I think that just continues to be um, the thing that I'm most most passionate about, and like most proud of, is each time I get to release music through this project um, because it's just so much me and so much my story. That's great. All right, that was my last like hardcore question question. Now so, I have rapid fires for you. Cool. And this is this or that. Like, would you? Would okay. you rather? All right. Would you rather produce or perform? Oh my gosh. Uh, produce. <laughs> perform. No, I'm gonna say perform. Okay, perform. All right. Would you rather be on tour or in the studio? In the studio. Answer that. <laughs> In the but studio. Traveling. I do like traveling, but on my own fruition. Not with smelly seven people <laughs> sleeping right next to you. No. Okay, great. Um, would you rather live action, watch a live action or animation? Oh, that's a tricky one. Um I think live action. Yeah. I do like a good Pixar though. Right. Like, Pixar and like classic Disney. I'm such a Disney nerd. Um, yeah, I'm gonna say live action though. I'm with you. And I'm a Disney nerd too. And I feel like that's an unpopular opinion, but live action, I'm with you. Okay, beach or mountains? Ooh. Mm. I'm gonna say, gosh, that's really hard. I'm going to say mountains only because my favorite trip and like the my favorite place I've been of all time is the Swiss Alps. Ooh, and like yeah. nothing, nothing has been even remotely close to as beautiful. Like I know these are rapid fire, but I'm gonna give a backstory. Anyways. Um, <laughs> I was backpacking through Europe, went to the Swiss Alps and like woke up and opened the blinds. And it was like snow covered mountains and like, kind of like woodsy and like just green pastures and waterfalls and it was just like yeah so it was I, I don't know if it was like full-on woods but there was woods woods nearby so I'm gonna go with woods beautiful no, I can't beautiful. even imagine you said <laughs> all right yeah beach or mountains okay mountains sorry I, I made it woods all of a sudden somehow I, I like it <laughs> what's up with that um cats or dogs Cat person or dog person? Yeah. Dogs? Oh yeah, like hands down. It, cats are cool, but uh, <laughs> they, I like dogs because they like us. Cats are just like, eh, whatever. I'm too cool. I'm like, eh, okay. There's, I have enough people like that in my life, so I don't need animals like that too. <laughs> I have the friendliest cats ever, but I've learned not to try to sell people on my cats. I think it's more like when someone gets their own, mm -hmm. and the cat's like their cat yeah. then it might change but yeah. um i respect that dog person yeah. i will i will let you live your your dog person left i put this in there because i had to eat lunch with nice people or eat nice people for lunch nice <laughs> that's from the okay we're on the villain side excellent if you don't know that's from disney's animation studios in california adventure when you go in and you take the quiz on figuring out who you're going to be what character that's right in the the cave with ursula ursula's cave right and that's where you do the touch screen yeah it's in the beast, beast library yeah, beast library that's right but yes right before that ursula's cave i don't even know if they have that ursula's cave anymore no i don't i loved that place i think i think it's like a break room like right before they closed <laughs> Oh, well, I'm glad you know that. I was just sad about losing my losing my amazing place where I got to sing along. Yeah, what the heck? <laughs> okay, and before we go, I'd like to ask for like a little blurb. If anyone walks away with anything from today's episode with you, Twitter style, <laughs> what would you want it to be? Um... fear isn't real um <laughs> like fear is just the worries of the future i mean like i guess this is a whole this is a whole nother podcast probably but <laughs> we like 
all we have is like this present moment, like right now, because the future is just worries. Like we worry about the future and like what may happen and, you know, and that's all that fear is. And so it's these like, what might happen? So it's not, it's, it's not even a real thing. It's just this thing that we assign value to. So like, and then the past is just like memories. Like we don't get to change that. And so I think just like stop letting fear take you out of the present moment. Um, and that's a reminder of myself of just like, there's so many things I want to be doing and, you know, I want to change my, like my physical body by exercising more, but I'm like, oh, but then I won't have enough time to rest. And you just start like adding this fear and this anxiousness and those sorts of things on you. So like, you know, fear isn't real. Like don't give it that power that it is asking of you um, and do the things that you you're passionate about and that you know will make a difference in your life um because yeah that can be so debilitating especially as creatives and so yeah fear isn't real <laughs> i like that yeah. very good and then how can people follow along how can they find you on social media uh my instagram is at hide your milk um just like it sounds nothing nothing fancy <laughs> um and that's the main that's the main source of social media I'm on. Uh, you can also go to matthewlindblad.com and I have a lot of my filmmaking work up there and some of my songs. And you can find Rebel Revive, my music project on Spotify. Um, it's a white lighthouse on the cover. If you just type it in, you'll find it. Um, yeah, that's it. Perfect. Thank you so much. I had such a good time talking to you and I got a lot out of it. I'm sure everyone else will too. Thank you. Yeah, this was a pleasure. So um, thanks for thanks for hosting me, Star. Thank you for listening to The Creative Strategist. Head over to starjerries.com backslash The Creative Strategist for notes on today's episode, information about upcoming events, or to nominate a guest for the show. Don't forget to leave a review and share this podcast with a friend or colleague. Thanks again for hitting play. See you next time, creative strategist.